Hello and welcome to Back of the Net and Beyond. And today I'm going to be speaking to David Gower, who's a former professional cricketer who captained England. How are you doing, David? You okay? Yeah, we're fine. Uh, yeah, at these sort of slightly testing times. Um, and of course, I suppose actually, yeah, when, when you talk about sort of the glorious past, as it were, or even just allude to the glorious past. Yeah. Here we are sitting around waiting for things to happen. <laughs> and luckily, as we speak, you know, we're not that far away from all being well. And in case, and just in case anything gets in the way, let's, let's let's not be too overconfident. But all being well, in a week's time or so, we'll have Test cricket, England against the West Indies. No crowds. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 sort of the weird things that have to happen nowadays. But it would be just so nice, actually, just from the point of view of my sport. Yeah. to get something back on the screens, to get interest going again. Um, because, I mean, let's face it, we've all been sitting around doing, you know, doing loads of gardening in my case, you know, <laughs> under duress, of course, yeah. uh, waiting for stuff to get back to something even vaguely normal. Mm, yeah, 100%. I uh, agree with you there. Um, I think the nation's waiting in the wings for, for something to happen. Um, we've got football back on the TV. Uh, I must admit, it's not the same with a, without a crowd there. Um, mm. But again... It's better than nothing, um, and as we all know, the life, uh, well, the health and safety of the general public is, is paramount uh, in these times anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, thanks for coming on, really appreciate your time. Um, in terms of yourself, um, what, what are you doing nowadays, if you just want to let the listeners know what you're kind of up to? Well, um, even I don't know. <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's the strange thing. Yeah. I mean, I... I, I'm in this sort of slightly precarious position at the moment, if I, if, without feeling sorry for myself, where everything I've done for the last 40-something years mm. has, I've got to say, by and large, gone pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if you sort of look back quickly, if I sort of summarise, what was it, something like 18 years as a professional sportsman, mm. um, something like 25 years or so, since then, as a broadcaster primarily, a bit of a you know, bit of journalism, a bit of writing thrown in, a few books, yeah, um, lots of this, that, and the other. Um, and it was no secret at the end of last summer. So mm. we're all actually it's almost a year on now. I mean, I know it's only end of June now, but yeah. you know, last September, I did my last game for Sky, okay, um, which I, I'd known was going to finish, you know, sort of for a year or two before that, but. I'd done my best to try and persuade them that was wrong. Done my best to try and persuade people that I still had a lot of life left in me, a lot of words, you know, sort of the hand still works, the mouth still works, yeah. brain still works. Um, somehow trying to persuade them to, as I say, change their minds, keep me on and allow me, uh, you know, whatever it might have been, a year or two or a few more years yeah. um, in that same job. Because, I mean, there are two things, there are two basic things from a selfish point of view. One is I love doing it. Mm. Um, Secondly, you get paid for it. And you know, in whichever world you live, yeah. uh, whatever your uh, aspirations, whatever the fun you have, whatever this, you know, in whichever world you live, it does help if you get paid because you know, we are professionals. Yeah. So I've been trying to sort of work out how to move this on since then. Okay. Um, COVID, of course, has thrown all sorts of plans up in the air. Mm. Um, we like to think a lot of things have been postponed. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, what, what was I meant to be doing this over the last three or four months? There would have been various lunches, dinners, possibly theatres, mm -hmm. um, all that sort of thing where you, you just use your what's left of your reputation uh, yeah. to, you know, to entertain, to earn a few bob here and there, gets you out and about. Uh, you know, one thing leads to another. I had various projects which I'd been sort of dreaming of in a way. Um, so projects that would have involved going away from cricket as such. Okay. I'm still using maybe a camera crew, still you know, doing sort of documentaries, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I mean, I had one, one idea I had, for instance, was when I was growing up, first six years of my life were in East Africa. Um, mm. We were in what was then Tanganyika, now Tanzania, living yeah. in Dar es Salaam. And when we left, it's still a very privileged thing to do, but my father, who'd been there for 25 years, give or take, uh, took us around as a family, so just the three of us, and we drove in a, how can I describe it, state-of-the-art, Cambridge Blue, Ford Anglia. 1963 okay. this is, I mean, and for those that have never seen a Ford Anglia, all I need to do is point you towards the Harry Potter films, you know, the magic flying car, that's your Ford Anglia. In fact, I've been looking for that car for years, now I know where it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we had one of those, you imagine dirt tracks in East Africa, we did the game parks in Northern Tanzania, 
Mm. Uh, we put it on a boat, we took it down to Mozambique to Byra, drove through Mozambique, drove through South Africa, put it on a boat in Cape Town, brought it home, and uh, it was still going some years later. I was six when we got back, six plus 11, 17 when I passed a driving test. I, I kept it going for about three weeks before I put it into a hedge somewhere in Leicestershire. <laughs> uh, but it, had <laughs> it had done sterling service. And I thought, you know, with a bit of, you know, with time and sort of looking for things to do and looking for a project, I thought if I could recreate that journey, for instance, yes. um, it would be fascinating. I mean, I love the wildlife. One of the things I do outside of cricket is, um, you know, a lot of sort of wildlife conservation, yeah. um, supporting various charities involved in that. And again, that goes back to those formative years in East Africa. So I would have loved to have gone back, just you know, any excuse to get back and do more of that. Um, but driving, for instance, through Mozambique, uh, which has changed horrendously. You know, just imagine the history of Mozambique over the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating to go through there, uh, you know, to talk to people on the way through, uh, to find out where, you know, how they survived civil war and all the rest of it. Yeah. And obviously then to go through South Africa, which is still a, you know, a glorious country scenically and in many, many ways, and again, home to lots of wildlife. But all these things, so that project, which I just started to work on, yeah. And I sort of talked to a couple of people about getting it done. You know, yeah, right, that's on hold for as long as you like, because no idea, none of us have any idea how long it's going to be before we can get back to any of those places. Yeah. So you're know, trying to use one's imagination to do things like that, which would be interesting, uh, fascinating to do, um, and you know, would take one in a slightly different direction. All that's kind of got to wait for now. Um, so at the moment, I'm just looking for the odd bits and pieces, you know, bit and piece here and there. We've got. Uh, one of the things we have going at the moment, two things actually, slightly linked, is Lord's Taverners as a charity with which I've been associated for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, and very kindly asked me to be their president, taking over from Trevor McDonald, Sir Trevor McDonald. Mm -hmm. So that started, but I mean, the, the only way I can describe that at the moment is it's uneventful. Okay. We have no event. <laughs> There's nothing we can do to, you know, raise the money that looks after the disadvantaged children yeah. that Lord's Taverners is so good at looking after. Linked to that, we have a travel company, Black Opal, who um, we did a trip to Cape Town with the Lord's Taverners just before lockdown, start of March, mm -hmm. and we're promoting some of their projects down there with the South African branch of Lord's Taverners. Right. Uh, one of the things they do so well, actually, is table cricket, which mm -hmm. for those that can't move, so the just you know, disabled kids who can sit at a table, build a little cricket bat, and you know, basically play on a ping pong table mm -hmm. with surrounds. It's been so successful in this country and we wanted to try and spread the word. So someone came up with the, the magic, which is table cricket on table mountain. Brilliant. Uh, and there you go. So, so all these little things are still going on. Yeah. I say little, and something like Lost Town is a huge, huge thing to take on and will be good as and when we can get out there. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still you know, receiving ideas, looking for ideas, looking for projects. Uh, you know, looking for things to be interesting and productive, uh, you know, both things being obviously important. That's amazing. It sounds like you're doing a lot of things and it, it's, it must be frustrating for yourself, along with, I'd probably say, 95%, if not all of the public in England and across the world at the moment, in terms of things just being on hold. And um, a lot of the things that you are doing are, are kind of for a good cause. Um, so hopefully going forward, you'll be able to kind of pick up the reins again and, and push those... Um, kind of um, well, push, push the avenues that you were kind of pursuing beforehand. Um, you touched on it slightly earlier on. You mentioned like since retiring, you've, you've brought up books and things and you've done some broadcasting and TV work. And obviously I've seen you many, many times on TV. I'll be honest with you. I think Sky should have you back as a, as a <laughs> cricket pundit. So hopefully that'll happen soon as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to just touch on your transition, because Again, you did many things and you still are active in many things, um, mm. broadcasting, the TV work. So when you finished playing cricket, how did you find that tr transition going from being a well-known cricketer, household name, playing for England, captain in England, um, absolutely flying at domestic level in cricket, to then step away from that and be on TV and it's a whole different ball game and you need to obviously, you've obviously got the, the knowledge of the game anyway, so that helps in, in many, many ways. But you need to step away from the playing side and you kind of maybe speaking about athletes, well, cricketers that you that maybe played against or teammates with, and you need to see things from a, a pundit point of view. And obviously being on TV and being in front of a TV camera and things on the other side of it, how did you find that? Um. 
well, the, the process went something like this. During the playing days, I was doing things like a uh, test match special on certain days when I wasn't playing, but other counties might have been. Yeah. Um, I was doing things like BBC TV, um, where, again, same sort of thing. My county in those days, or well, early days, was Leicestershire. Well, first, what, 15 years ago, so was Leicestershire. The last three, four years, four years was Hampshire. So if we were not involved, I would you know, pitch up somewhere and talk about someone else playing a B&H semi-final or an West semi-final, yeah. uh, getting some time in that way. I did um, a couple of seasons down in Australia with Channel 9, right. uh, which was brilliant because they, I mean, they, uh, they were brilliant at what they did. You had people like Richie Benno, who's the best person to learn from, mm -hmm. people like Tony Gregg, who, again, understood that business beautifully. Um, some old adversaries like Ian Chappell, Greg Chappell, those sort of guys. Mm. And that was interesting, sort of having to fight one's own corner a little bit as the visiting Englishman. But yeah. I did a World Cup in 92 down there, and the following year went out and did uh, some of the test series between Australia and West Indies. I had, yeah, so really good learning curve. Yeah. And then the preparation went like this. When I was ready to stop playing, I'm ready to make that decision that, you know, time to walk away from the whites, you know, put the whites up on a hook on the wall somewhere and leave them there for good. Mm. Um, I had some very good management, which had already put in place the offers of jobs as a journalist for the Sunday Express, BBC TV, a radio show on Radio 5, magazine show on BBC Two, that sort of stuff. So there was a lot of stuff planned. And all I had to say was, yes, I'm now ready. Let's go. And that was basically, I suppose, predicated on the background of having done that stuff beforehand. So you do a bit of practice, show willing, uh, make sure people know that you can still speak English. Uh, you're going to put those thoughts into the right sort of order. Yeah. And again, I'd say learning from someone like Richie Benno was absolutely brilliant. Having someone like Richie to sit alongside as one of the great wordsmiths of our era. Yeah. And one of the great sort of commentators. He knew everything about broadcasting. You just pick things up almost by osmosis, just by looking and learning. Mm. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the immediate transition then requires you straightforwardly to learn the job. And, you know, the rhythm of commentary, for instance, is not complicated, but if you get it wrong, it doesn't work. Um, having opinions helps. <laughs> That's all part of the job. Yeah. Uh, being able to explain, for instance, with sports like cricket, where we all know there's a lot of stuff going on in people's heads. Uh, and the great thing about, say, batting is that it's a very human occupation. We make mistakes for all sorts of reasons. And therefore... One of the things you think you have to learn very quickly is you have to try and explain other people's mistakes. Right. Not through your own eyes, because, you know, you made your mistakes in your way. They made mistakes for other reasons, but with a certain understanding. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, commentary, as Richie said, is about adding to the picture. On television, it's about adding to the picture, not trying or trying not to state the obvious. So lots of things like that you sort of build up as you go along. Yeah. Um, and then when I moved from not just commentary, but presenting as well. At the end of my six years at the BBC, I presented a test match at the Oval, moved to Sky, did the World Cup in 99, and stayed there for 20 years, which was, it was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely loved it. There are an extraordinary set of people that you work with there. Yeah. Um, and again, that enthusiasm, you know, what, the, what I loved about that as much as anything else was that you have, for instance, if you're doing a test match at Lords, mm -hmm. a live test match at Lords, I might be the face. I might be the one that comes on at 11 o'clock, that's right, at 10 o'clock in the morning and says, you know, good morning and welcome to Lords. Day one of the first test or second test match against West Indies, Pakistan, whoever it might be. Yeah. So you might be the face, but you've got people around you in the commentary box who know this stuff. You've got another crew of uh, production staff who love the game. And their enthusiasm drives you on because they've worked hard to prepare for that day. They've worked hard to make sure that day goes well. Yeah. And they produce stuff for the intervals and you've got the camera crews, the sound crews. That tent of, I mean, there's about 100 people there trying to make that thing work. And um, therefore you have this real team spirit, not just the people in the commentary box, mm. uh, many of whom, one or two like Ian Botham has been a friend and colleague for 40 odd years. Others like Atherton Hussein, you know, who are excellent at what they do, have been people I watched originally, played yeah. a little bit when I gave Michael Atherton his first cap in 1989 against Australia. So as captain of England in a yeah. really very bad year, but you know, Athers made his debut there. We get on so well. Um, but you, know, you, you uh, live with these people on and off, as it were, through a summer, through a tour. Um, but you realise, of course, that it is that extra big team effort that makes the whole thing work. So that is all a wonderful place to be working. 
mm. um, but at the front of you, but on your own side, a little bit, in fact, very similar to actually playing cricket. You, again, as a batsman, you are marked um, on your performance. So the runs you make on any given day are there for all to see. For me as a presenter, for instance, I would probably rate myself at the end of each day. I mean, you know right. instantaneously if you've had a good day or a bad day, if the interviews yeah. have gone well, if your links have been good, if everything you've talked about has been fluent and you know, you, you know a good day and you know a day when you think, well, you know, I could have done a lot better. Mm. And I think you've got, you know, that sort of self-honesty is important in any career. And also when you're talking again about cricket commentary, honesty with those opinions. So for instance, when, when you are talking, when, in the early days when you're talking about former colleagues who are still playing, and your opinions are going to be coloured by that because, you know, they're yeah. still friends. They're still people that you've shared the emotions of a test match with. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sometimes hard to go straight from one to the other and be entirely blunt, as it were. Mm -hmm. But you learn very quickly, of course, that that screen, that thing that you're appearing on, and when you've got to say an audience of whatever it might be, you know, half a million, a million cricket fans, they also know the game. Although we are there to try and explain the finer points of it. Mm. cannot pull the wool over their eyes. I mean, if, you, if, yeah. if there's been a, you know, a bad couple of hours, if England's just had a bad day, they know it, I know it, England know it, you know, the players know it. Yeah. And if, you try, if, for instance, you try and dress it up and say, well, just a couple of things went wrong, <laughs> well, these things happen, you know. Actually, um, you've got to you know, basically tell it how it is. And people like you know, Ian Botham, as I say, long-time friend and colleague, mm. was pretty good at that. Mike Lowerton is very good at um, you know, judging a day. NASA is brilliant at you know, cutting to the chase and saying, well, that was good, that was bad, that was somewhere in between. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what makes punditry uh, both interesting and, interesting and valuable. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, there's so many things there that I didn't realise, and in some ways as a viewer, whenever you're watching mm -hmm. sport, you can become quite ignorant. You mentioned there, there could be, obviously, you in front of the screen, and that's all we see. And essentially, my mindset is it's probably you, the cameraman, and maybe someone... I don't know, holding the boom or whatever, but you mentioned there could be a hundred people like in that vicinity, all making it work, all in kind of tandem. And you don't realize how big an operation it is. And I'm assuming if kind of one thing breaks down, you need someone else to maybe pick up the reins and things like that. So, I mean, it, when we see people like yourself on TV and obviously you come across brilliantly and you're obviously very knowledgeable about the, the obviously the game that you were in, um, Again, you don't realise like the, the background and obviously everyone that's making you look good or even better than you are, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, from that aspect, um, from that aspect, I didn't really actually think about that to be honest. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm glad you touched on that. I mean, the interesting thing to me is that the, when when I did it, fine. I mean, I you say you do a bit of practice here and there, you learn the ropes, uh, you make mistakes, um, you try and learn from those mistakes, obviously. Mm. Uh, and you see other people trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And there is this, you know, it can be very judgmental in the sense that, you know, there might be someone with as much experience as me who might have played, say, you know, 80, 100 test matches, mm. who might just not quite have the something, the little, you know, little unknown that makes them actually a good commentator. Yeah. And sometimes those judgments are made very quickly by people who say, well, thanks for coming, but actually, no, don't worry again. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, Sometimes people are given a bit more leeway. I mean, I had a lot of practice before I was, as it were, put up front. Um, I remember Nasser, bless him, when he first came from the England team to Sky yeah. and was very naive about what it takes to be a cricket pundit and to say, and they give you things like interviewing players, you know, the task is they go and interview a player, mm. um, which is always awkward the first couple of times you do it because you're, you know, you're, I remember him interviewing Matthew Hoggard in South Africa um, on, NASA's first tour as a commentator. It was a very awkward thing. Um, within a year, he'd become very, very good at just asking the right questions, mm. following the right leads, and he became a very, very sort of um, insightful and investigative interviewer of players. Mm. And that's, that's the sort of transition you have to make. Um, so, you know, some people make it, some people don't. Um, and you're always, I say, you've always got to be self critical you've always got to sort of look at yourself and work out if you're, as it were, trying, if you're putting the time in research, uh, making sure that you're professional about what you do. Yeah. Um, and I remember, what's, what's interesting, I remember Andrew Strauss, who obviously was a very fine England cricketer, mm -hmm. very fine England captain, is a very methodical, 
very organized, very bright man. Um, and I remember Andrew coming in to do his first college student at Lords one year, the year after he'd retired. Yeah. And he sort of kind of strolled in at half a state in the morning, like the rest of us, um, with the show going on at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And he was amazed about at the extent of the activity. You've got a producer there, probably Hendo, Brian Henderson, who's there with lots of paper in front of him, computer in front of him, telling people what you know, he's got orders for the sound department, get over there. Cameras, get over there. Michael Addison, get over there, interview so and so. NASA, get over there, interview someone else. Um, oh. David, I'll run through the hour long script, you know, the sort of the, the schedule with you, and we'll, I'll tell you what's coming up. And I'll go, yeah, do that, do that, tick, 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 tick. So I go off and read that and start to memorize what I need to do. Mm. And it's quite frenetic, especially the first morning again. Poor old Andrew comes into this, sort of thinking he just will sit down, have a cup of coffee, and you know, <laughs> sometimes he'll start doing some commentary. Yeah. And then when you actually start, um, you know, and someone puts a microphone in front of you and the earpiece in and all the rest of it, then it's just a different ball game. Everyone, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. Anyone and everyone can do it at home. Yeah. Um, suddenly when you've actually got to be the man putting those words in the right order at the right time, um, off the top of your head instinctively, um, like so many things that are instinctive or made to look instinctive, it just takes a bit of time to, to hone that instinct. So Andrew actually was, I think, very impressed, realized he had some catching up to do. Mm. Um, and then, you know, had a couple of seasons with us where he very happily joined the team and then went on to what I would call rather different things in administration, which he then did very well. I mean, talk about transitions. Mm. He, for instance, um, as a captain, was well prepared. You know, he'd read various management technique books. Um, he'd studied man management. Um, and that showed, I think, in the way he led that England team. He had a lot of respect in the Indian dressing room. Mm. So when he went from there to us, slightly different ball game, when he left us, and had the offer to go to the ECB and basically run the England team and the, sort of the England professional game. Yeah. Um, he had the right sort of skills in place because he was prepared to do that. Right. And I mean, for him, he, I mean, he was making what I would call a success of that job with some tough decisions already taken. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the, the very sad death of his wife, Ruth, has put that, you know, meant that he had to then refocus on his boys. He's now refocused again on the uh, you know, the Ruth Strauss Foundation, which is going from strength to strength. And so there you've got a man with a lot of character and the nous to make all these things work. Um, and probably a bit of a cushion from his playing days in terms of the, yeah. the financial side. But yeah, that's, it's that adaptability that allows people with those skills to move on and to move into other things. Mm. In terms of commentary, um, I mean, obviously with any sport, you get, from a viewer's perspective, you get very, you get a varied amount of, say, understanding. So you can get someone who mm. understands the game really well. Uh, let's let's say, yep. for argument's sake, who have been an ex-player and um, they understand the game and they've had a sustained career. And then you get someone else who maybe just likes to watch cricket but doesn't really understand like the ins and outs of it. And then you've got everything in between. So I'm assuming from a commentary perspective, you need to be quite inclusive in terms of how you portray the game, how you pass on the information to the general public. Very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, nowadays, of course, there's pretty much instant feedback if you want to take it from things like Twitter and social media. Mm. Um, and there'll be people still emailing in. And I guess there's probably still people phoning in yeah. uh, with their opinions and what they might have just heard. And the interesting thing, of course, about all sport like that is that of the, say there's a, you know, there's a big day of cricket and there's a million people watching. Mm. Of that million, I mean, I don't know what proportions would be, but a large number will be, for instance, keen cricket enthusiasts. They might well have played to a high level. They'll understand most things. They don't need to be told the easy things, mm. but they want the more esoteric stuff. You might have people who are watching with them who know nothing about it, who need something else explained. So you've got a real range of potential people, or potential audience out there, mm. uh, some, of, some of whom need more explaining. Um, and again, all the feedback we used to get um, covered that ground. I mean, some people saying, well, we need to know more about why this happened, why does the ball swing, or why, and those at the more experienced end saying, I don't want to listen to that stuff, I just want to know why, you know, why Kevin Peterson nicked it, you know, mm -hmm. why, you know, all these sort of things, and so you do have to cover a range, um, and I think, you're know, looking back on it all, um, both when I worked at the BBC and at Sky for all that time, you know, I think we pretty much, by and large, got it 
you know, just about right. Um, yeah, enough people would be happy with what they'd listened to, happy with what they saw. Um, but it is, it's mighty hard to cover that whole range of potential, of an audience with potentially very different understanding. Yeah. Of what, you know, still the same stuff on the screen, mm. still the same game, still the same players, and yet, you know, even in a sort of small sample of sort of 10, 15, 20 people, the opinions would be 10, 15, 20, uh, and diverse accordingly. So it's, uh, you know, you're, you're always trying to cater to that. And of course, if you're, I mean, the, one of the things you've always got to be careful of, and I, I guess so even more so nowadays than ever, is that when you're, comment when you're commentating on a sport which involves England, Australia, New Zealand, West Indies, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, South Africa, you know, these diverse countries, different cultures. Yeah. I was always very careful, I think, and I hope, to be aware of the, the audience. Mm. Because if you just, for instance, looked at it from an, uh, an Anglo-centric point of view, mm. uh, and we were always told, you know, always asked not to be, you know, not to be England supporters, but to be as yeah. neutral as possible. Every now and again, the words us and them would creep into Preston <laughs> yeah. commentary or his punditry. Mm. But you know, the point is you've got an audience there which might come from saying, you know, looking, looking ahead, say, to next week and England play the West Indies. Well, there will be English fans, there will be West Indies fans, mm -hmm. uh, and they'll come from all over the place. Um, that would probably be broadcast across the world into the Caribbean as well. So yeah. you know, the guys who are working on that test match uh, in my book, needs to be aware that they have to cater for both sets of fans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both sets, well, I say both, there's probably multitudes of ethnicities, mm -hmm. uh, and understand that there are going to be people out there listening who will have, you know, a thousand different views. And it's, you know, that's a mighty tricky thing to master. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, you know, I'll come back to the other, you know, back to that word honesty, where whatever you say, um, if you're, for instance, discussing the very tri you know, very simple example, an LBW decision, which actually nowadays, of course, with things like DRS, a lot of the decision-making process is almost done by the technology, and sort of, you know, your final analysis is done by the technology. But if you're making comments on that sort of thing, um, you have to be aware that there are two sides involved. And, yeah, and your honest opinion mm -hmm. should not be clouded by anything, by any other influence. Right. Um, so, you know... You might be a former England player mm. and you might want a decision to go England's way yeah. um, for that sort of you know, patriotic reason. Mm. But as a commentator, as a pundit, you are not there to, to do that. I understand. I mean, there's, there's many facets there that you touched on and it, it, does, it does sound a lot harder than I thought. I, I mean, I wasn't sitting here thinking it was an easy thing, but you've got all the, the, the things that you mentioned there, aside from standing in front of a, a camera and broadcasting to people but you've got um, a script to follow to a certain degree you mentioned leads that you need to kind of latch onto. you've got the whole team kind of i don't know waiting in the wings really hoping that you do well um yeah. and again it's just a lot of pressure anyway in general especially when you kind of play the game to a certain level so people expect you to come across a certain way in terms of your commentary i always remember you kind of just coming across really relaxed um and you, you seem to take it in your stride um, you mentioned there um, slightly earlier that you were commentating and doing a bit of broadcasting whilst you were playing. So did that make your transition away from cricket slightly easier then? Yeah, I mean, that, that was, um, in a sense, that was just common sense. So that, it, was, it was fun as well. It was interesting to do. Um, and there is this thing, actually, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of players um, do two things. One is... When they're playing, mm. they are, in a very human way, sort of resistant to commentary or very critical of commentary because they don't like being criticised. So um, um, one of the interesting things for me was that those last, say, I don't know, four years, four or five years of my career when I was starting to do a bit of telly like that in between, it gives you the understanding of why and how people say the things they do when they're talking about you as players. Mm -hmm. And I became almost sort of, I don't know, uh, evangelical in the dressing room. At Hampshire, for instance, I remember talking to people like, say, Robin Smith. Mm -hmm. Now, Robin was a brilliant player, uh, very gutsy, very talented, very productive, but sensitive. Yeah. Um, and the, the, so the, the, the underneath bit of Robin Smith was actually quite sensitive. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we always had this very funny thing where if there was a televised game on, we were on that 
field being televised that day. For instance, say a Benton Hedges semi-final or a NatWest semi-final at mm. Southampton. Television, a little old grotty television set in the corner of the room, propped up on a stand up in the corner by the ceiling there. Mm. But, yeah, so you could see, you could be basically come out, dismissed, out. And by the time you get back in to the dressing room itself, the replays are still going on. And someone is yeah. still saying, well, that were a bad shot or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and I always say, well, just turn the sound down for starters. If you don't want to hear the commentary, just turn the sound down. If you want to look at your dismissal, just look at it. Um, and I used to say to people like Robin, okay, you've just heard someone dis you know, describe your dismissal. Mm. Um, just ask yourself this question. Was what they said fair or not? Because as a sportsman, you're angry because you just got out. Yeah. So you don't want to hear criticism. But actually, if you take five minutes to think about it, was what, for instance, in that era, um, when I was still down at Hampshire, people like, for instance, Railingworth, my first captain at Leicestershire, was still probably doing television on the BBC. Right. Um, you, I might hear, in fact, I, I remember there was one, there was one of the, I think it was a Benson's final at Lords, mm. uh, Hampshire against Kent, I think he was, and Raymond was commentating. So my old captain, who I'd known at the stage probably for, you know, best part of 20 years, mm. um, we had a very good relationship, um, and I remember this, it was an instant where I ran round on a ball as a fielder, picked it up with my left hand, mm. underarm, flicked it in, hit the stumps, and I could tell that that fellow was out by a foot. This is in the days before the umpires had recourse to technology. So it was an instant decision by the umpire who said not out. I could see it was out by a foot, foot and a half. The replay, I know this because I saw, saw it on the highlights later. Uh, the replay showed the batsman's out by a foot, foot and a half. Mm. Raymond's commentary was along the lines of, well, if he if he used his right hand, he'd have been on it quicker, and he'd been run out by a yard. <laughs> I'm going, Raymond. You know, I'm so Raymond. You're meant to be my mate. You're my captain. You're my ally. Yeah. So what's wrong with going on your left hand, which actually worked beautifully, picking the ball up cleanly, throwing it, hitting the stumps, and running someone out by a foot? It's not my fault that the umpire didn't give it out. Yeah. Um, and so things like you. Know, so it's very easy to do. So, yeah. so but if you look at yourself and say, look at yourself. Mm. Honestly, and say, well, okay, yeah, you walk back in the pavilion, you just played a shot, you just got out. Why did you do it? Was it your fault? Was it Bowler's fault? Uh, was it somewhere in between? Be honest uh, with yourself, and that's actually very helpful as a player. Um, mm. And then that's the same sort of thought process you take in when you start doing commentary. But it's one of those things. There's always going to be an us and them. And you know, there I, I remember again another sort of little moment at Newcastle Airport. We've been watching England play a one-day international um, up in Durham. Mm -hmm. And they were flying down to Southampton, as was I, for the next mm -hmm. game. And there's a bit of time to kill. And I sort of wandered in with the briefcase and you know, the jacket and the rest of it. And happened to sit down against uh, opposite Jonathan Trott. And Jonathan just looked at me and said, morning. And he said, why do you guys talk such on television? <laughs> I said, hold on a second. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I remember this, you know, it's, it's, it's always there, that sort of us and them mentality, yeah. which is that, you know, but I said to John, look, Jonathan, I said, look, to be fair, um, I said, look, if you play well, we will say you played well. Yeah. If you individually or as a team have a bad day, I'm sorry, but we've got to say you've yeah. had a bad day because, oh, again, yeah. talking about the public at the other end of the screen, mm. they know you've had a bad day. If I say, you know, Jonathan Trott was out for 10, uh, very, very unlucky with, you know, just, you know, and, this, and, he, and he knows, and I know, he's played a bad shot for the sake of argument. Yeah. Well, you can't hide that. And no. if England have had a bad day, well, you can't hide that. Mm. Um, so he sort of listened and we exchanged. And of course, looking at it now, Jonathan, who had a, you know, he was a very, very fine player, mm. um, did some you know, extraordinary things with a bat for England. Mm. He's now moved through that. He's been through some tough times. You know that as well. Uh, and I, you know, he's dealt with that. And he's now doing bits of punditry. He's now doing this, that, and the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you, you know, it comes, you sort of, you do move from one territory to the next. And mm -hmm. you do gain that understanding, sometimes too late, because, um, you know, if you knew these things when you first started as a player, mm -hmm. um, you know, it might actually help psychologically uh, and certainly might be a defense mechanism or an understanding. The more you understand these things, the better it is when you, you sometimes feel affronted by what's said about you or written about you. That's true. I'm afraid yeah. that's, never, that's never going to change. I mean, you know it from sport. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. You know, and because you, you see it so differently on the field. Of course you do, yeah. 
if that perspective is so different to the one that, for instance, the journalist has or the TV commentator has or the spectator yeah. has, that you've, you're always going to have to go through that thing where you have to kind of explain it away uh, to them. And therefore, you have to learn to deal with that for yourself. I understand. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with what you just said there. Um, in terms of um, kind of transferable skills, because I always try to, I always try and get this point across or ask this question to my uh, my guests on the show. What what transferable skills did you take from cricket to aid you doing what you're doing now? So all the work you're doing now, in a nutshell. So the TV work. Uh, broadcasting, the punditry, writing a book. What skills did you take from cricket and the career that you had in cricket? Um, what, what, what did you take from that to bring to you in terms of doing your book and everything else? I think um, it's a very good question. I think I can probably try and summarize it in two ways. One is that the thing, one of the things that is such a great benefit for team sport. Mm. is that you are always reminded you are part of a team. Mm. There are some notable exceptions who took single-mindedness to a, a new level, but most of us and most people who come through a team sport mm. are always aware of the importance of team. And so if you're going, for instance, into a broadcasting situation, both with the half a dozen people that might be sharing a commentary box with you, and those other 90 people I was talking about who are part of that production team, mm -hmm. then you need to remember that they make you look good, sound good, and mm -hmm. that you are all in this, to use that cliched phrase, together, mm -hmm. um, and that you just need to be, you know, just need to respect the team. Yeah. So I, used to, I used to enjoy actually spending time, for instance, if we're away in Leeds or Birmingham or Manchester somewhere at a test match, staying in a hotel for three, four, five nights, whatever it takes, Mm -hmm. And you've got, you know, I can go out to dinner with Michael Addison or with Nasser Hussain or Ian Botham or David Lloyd mm -hmm. um, or Brian Henderson. Or you, and you can do all that. But there are other guys working on that show. Mm -hmm. um, production teams, uh, production crews, assistant producers. And I used to enjoy spending time with them because, as I say, they're all enthusiasts. Yeah. And they all work mighty hard. Mm -hmm. um, they're interesting to be with. They're fun to be with. So as you, you can sort of... You can really enjoy that sort of that kind of team spirit when you when you meet in the morning. You come in at say eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning, ten o'clock start on air, mm. and you might say at the Lord's Media Centre there might be ten fifteen cameramen having a cup of coffee before their day starts. Yeah, uh, you, you know, stand and have a chat with them and see how they're getting on. And you know, you, over the years, because there's a a lot of very faithful performers in that sphere. You know, over the years you get to know these guys in some cases really well, some cases you just sort of know who they are you know it's it's a it's a really nice thing to keep that sort of team spirit going but then in terms of the skills needed um to make a success of say broadcasting or journalism well then a lot of it's up you know again re relies on your own uh it might be education it might be natural you know, whatever, you know whatever it takes to put words in the right order for instance if you're either writing or speaking yeah you know, getting the right words out getting them out in the right order and at the right time Mm -hmm. is kind of key to the job um there's a little bit of leeway nowadays i think there's i mean if you looked at the, the great broadcasters when i was growing up mm -hmm. and for instance i mean you go back to richie benno of course but on radio you have magnificent people like brian johnston mm -hmm. uh, john arlott um yeah and a lot of their phrases live with me now a lot of the things that they said when i was growing up when i just started to play um, and they were still in commentary box. You know, those sort of things live with you because they were just very good at what they did. Yeah. Um, but a lot of what you take with you, I mean, see, the, the, the hard part would be this. For me, um, I would count myself very lucky that going from playing to talking yeah. about the same sport, you take a lot of knowledge with you from playing. And that's obviously one of the main reasons they hire you in the first place. So you already know the business. The really hard thing, is when players leave cricket and they don't have the, you know, they're not one of the lucky ones that gets to do radio or TV, mm -hmm. but they have to go and find something else to do. Now, if you coach, fine. I mean, coaching is a specialist occupation. It's much more specialist now than it ever used to be. There are, for instance, lots of my former colleagues still coaching at schools and clubs around the country. 
Yeah. Uh, um, you know, that wasn't, was never going to be my bag, I don't think. Mm. Um, but if you have to go into a completely different business, then that is so tough. Um, and you, know, you can think of all sorts of examples of players who basically failed to do that. Mm. Uh, and in some cases, tragically so. So, I mean, that's, that's, a real, that's, the, that's the other end of the scale, which you've got to be so aware of. And that's why, for instance, we have in our game, the Professional Cricketers Association, PCA, yeah. who have grown um, in the 50 years of their life or so, they've grown into an organization which just is, not, is much more than just, say, a trade union for cricketers. Yeah. And for instance, the, um, the charity arm of the PCA has been absolutely vital for those ex-cricketers who've been in trouble financially, psychologically, physically, whatever it might be, there is support there. And the, the other thing they do is give, them, give people careers advice. So if you want to go and do a PCA-supported careers course mm -hmm. to help you make that change, there is likely to be something there that they can help you with. Um, right. And that has grown. I mean, that's, that's brilliant because I think that, that is so important with all sports mm. um, because if you've kicked a football, if you've hit a cricket ball, um, if you've passed a rugby ball, whatever it might be you've done for the last 15 years, mm. you, and you're looking for something to do and you have no idea what to do, um, schemes like that and organisations like that are absolutely vital mm. for so many people. Um, and it's always... Um, it's always sort of... What's the word for it? Um, it's always good just to be aware of what they're doing with people who haven't been as lucky as, for instance, I have. Yeah. Um, and I can claim a certain skill, yes. I can claim that... You know, bits of it are all my own work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and happily so. But, you know, I have been very lucky because that transition was made easy for me too. Mm -hmm. um, and all I had to do in a sense was just make it work, which up until recently it was working very nicely. So that's, that's been very good news. Um, but I'm hugely sympathetic to mm -hmm. people who, for instance, haven't played for England. They might have played for a county for the best part of 20 years. Yeah. In 15 years, and they come out of that, you know, maybe with a benefit behind them, a little bit of a cushion, but they come out of it with, say, yeah, let's say for the sake of argument, you're 35 years old, maybe a couple of years older, and you know, you've now got to find something to do for the next 40 years. Mm. It's, tough. it's a hugely, hugely daunting thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. Just, I'm lucky. I mean here am I at 63 mm. with a sort of an empty diary thinking, Hang on a second. Um, you know, with medals, medical science as it is, even with things like COVID around, um, you know, I could be on this planet for a lot longer yet. Therefore, yeah, I want to do something. You know, I need to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, I obviously want to, as I was saying at the start, I want to have, you know, have challenges which I enjoy, projects I enjoy, things I can do. You know, we all want to, if we can, enjoy what we do. And I, again, yeah. happily make the point that I've been very lucky to do that for so long um but you know keeping these things going that's the next challenge so i think we you know we all have a challenge like that at some stage but mm. i really feel for the guys in sports who find that challenge um let's say 35 or even worse you imagine those guys and it can happen in any sport again who had dreams of a 15-year career they join for instance a county club and mm. at the age of say 22 maybe 23 that county club decides that actually they're not going to make the grade and they're going to try and bring another 17-year-old through yeah. uh, and they say, I'm sorry, but we're not re renewing your contract. And suddenly mm -hmm. you've got, oh, well, hang on. It's not just, you know, 40 years. It's, it's a long time left where you know, suddenly someone's got to pick up the pieces. So again, things like the having something like the PCA there to help you if need be, I think that's, that's absolutely invaluable. That is massive. And um, I've done a bit of research on the PCA as well. Um, and it's basically similar to the PFA in football, uh, mm. similar organisation, been around for a similar amount of years. And it's tough for those guys because they try and do their best and sometimes they get um, kind of a bit of bad press now and again. But, I mean, it can't be it can't be easy, especially in these times as well, where certain times where you may have been in a situation where your contract's coming to an end, certainly now with the pandemic, mm. it is kind of unexpectedly. And you were doing well and you were kind of hoping to get whatever you were hoping to get in terms of money, financially, I don't know, a couple of years contract or whatever. It's, mm -hmm. it's taken out of your hands now because obviously the money's, the money aspect has been taken away. There's financial uncertainty at these football clubs, cricket clubs, whatever it may be. So anyone that's out of contract, 
they may be in a bit of a situation where they're in limbo and what they thought they were going to get as or, or use as a bargaining tool isn't there anymore it's out of their hands um so and i've been there myself before uh, many many times so i know what you're going through uh, i mean all i can say is be positive from that perspective um things generally do work themselves out anyway um but in terms of again um obviously what you were doing so you you transitioned out and you did a bit of broadcasting tv work and stuff would you advise any um athletes to do something be active in something whilst being active in their chosen sport would you be an advocate for that yes i would um i mean again going back as an example actually goes back a long long time and i had a one of the i don't know i can say it was a sort of father figure to me a fellow called fred rumsey Mm. Now, Fred actually, coincidentally, was one of the founding fathers of the PCA. Okay. Um, and he's a lovely guy, great man, um, played, what, so I think it was something like seven test matches for England, mm. and had, but had a long county career. But during that career, he also had a, um, a sort of realisation that he needed to plan for the future. So he went into things, he did travel, um, wow. and was actually very successful for a while, uh, so sort of was very successful for a while. Mm. So the... Uh, that's just a sort of one example um, where in those days, um, I, I'm, you know, in, if, it was almost a cliche then, in those days a lot of former professional sportsmen hung up their boots and went and run a pub yeah. because they had, you know, had a face, yeah. and they sort of stood behind a bar you know, dispensing stories mm. for free as it were, but trying to you know, rake in a few quid by selling a few pints. Yeah. And in yeah. some cases, again, in some cases, the better ones would um make that really successful others would just sort of poodle along and yeah, make a living mm. um again there are so many examples of things that people had to do and in those in my early days as a county player every winter you had to find something to do so mm. there were lots of teachers for instance who in those days were able to negotiate with schools and say i'm going to be playing cricket in the summer but you know i'll do two term i'll do the winter term and the easter term yeah and that was schools happy to let that happen when I started playing very soon after that, um, the world was changing very rapidly and a lot of schools said, actually, we need you here full time. Mm -hmm. And so that option became less easy. Um, but again, lots of, some of my former colleagues went back to teaching, back to coaching at schools, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a, a number of different ways of, as it were, keeping yourself going. But um, it can be, as I say, it just, just to repeat really, it can be so very, very hard if you don't have that opportunity or don't find that opportunity. However hard you try, sometimes that opportunity can be rather elusive. But yeah. yes, the answer to the question is yes, if you have got something that you think you're good at, yeah. and you can sort of kind of start it up as you're still playing, so you've got something to go to when you finish, yeah. um, then that's not a bad thing to have. Nowadays, of course, I would have to say that virtually every sport is much more full-time than it used to be. Yeah. You imagine when I was growing up, rugby was part-time. It was an amateur game. Yeah. Um, now it's really professional. Uh, if you imagine you know, soccer, the, the summer break was longer. Mm. If you imagine cricket, you know, the season was so long and some of my former colleagues like a fellow called Chris Balderston would play professional football in the winter, professional cricket in the summer, and it would overlap. <laughs> he famously left a game my first summer at Leicestershire mm. uh, when they won the championship for the first time in their history, not through any efforts of mine, I can promise you. Mm. But I was 12th man at Chesterfield, uh, one of the last two or three games of the season, where Chris was something I know, for sake of argument, 80 not out at the end of the day at Chesterfield. Went off, played a professional football match for, I think it was now, Doncaster or someone, yeah, or Carlisle or someone. Um, but he played a professional football match that night, came back to his hotel in Chesterfield, put the pads on again in the morning, made his 100, and we won wow. the game. Um, <laughs> yeah, but again, nowadays, that can't happen. There is no way you can play both sports. So wow. you know, the time involved, and cricket is now contracted um, throughout the year in most cases. So, you know, the, the, the opportunity to have a sort of double career is not quite what it was beforehand. Um, but the sense of having an idea of where you might go next is a good idea for anyone. And you mentioned earlier that you were, um, you've got a keen interest in conservation. Um, mm. And previously you'd launched um, the World Land Trust with David Attenborough. So just delve into that a little bit. <laughs> That's one of them, yeah. Actually, the um, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I didn't exactly launch it with him. Um, and let's face it, in the, in the field of conservation, 
the other David has a slightly bigger reputation than mine. <laughs> um, but he is, I mean, he is absolutely, he is an absolute national treasure, of course. Um, yeah. And brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I mean, any of us who ever watched an Ashburn program, you know, either the last, well, yeah, throughout his long, long career. Um, yeah, amazing. Full of admiration. But yeah, Well Land Trust, as an example, mm. is a relatively small charity which actually worked on the premise um, that in certain areas they would just literally buy land, mm. which could have been once farmland. Um, I mean, I'll give you one example Patagonia, South America, lots of sheep farming. Um, they bought up a lot of Patagonia to put it back into wildlife. Okay. Um, and that was, you know, that, that's a, a simple example of what they use their money for. And then you allow that land to become dedicated to wildlife. Uh, and that means not just animals, but the, you know, the terrain, the environment, the whole thing. Um, and they've done that all over the world. Um, so they are a lovely little charity and very happy to be associated with them. And I've done various things for them over the years. Um, you know, theatre nights. All, it's been great. Um, there are others like, for instance, the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation. Mm. And when it comes, when I ever use the words David and Shepherd, the cricketing link, there was the Bishop of Liverpool, David Shepherd, who yeah. played for England. There was the umpire and Gloucester player, former Gloucester player, David Shepherd, who, you know, Shep was one of the great men. But this particular David Shepherd, you know, painted all sorts of things, from elephants to tigers to snow leopards to uh, trains to aircraft. In a wonderful long career, which sadly you know, we lost him a couple of years ago now. Mm. But it's a family run charity, the, the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation, which I've supported for the last 30 plus years now um, because it, it just it's brilliant. They are such a nice group of people and doing such good work. I do, I do, I'm a patron of Tusk, another very good charity. I have a friend in Australia called Nicholas Duncan who has something called Save, which is short for Save the Rhino. And he dedicates his efforts to Zimbabwe and the wildlife in Zimbabwe. So all these things have been, I've been able to help out over the years. Yeah. Um, I've done a bit of travel with them over the years, um, uh, which sort of works for both of us. You know, I'm, I get the enjoyment of being in an environment away from the game, which I've always loved. Um, hopefully they get a bit of benefit from it as well in promoting what they're trying to do to both raise money and conserve uh, the world as we should have it. Yeah. Uh, so that that's that's been a very good um, sideline to have, uh, and again, there are things I'd still like to do with that. Mm. Uh, I'll always continue to support those same people mm. um, because they're dedicated people doing wonderful things in that sphere. I mean, the the tricky thing with charity, of course, is always that you know people come to you with all sorts of ideas, and you you can talk about a million different things that need people's money. Yeah, uh, I am involved with other in other spheres. Some of the medical, some of the you know, so all sorts of things, which I do what little I can now and again. Sometimes I'm afraid it is little, just mm -hmm. to sort of help along. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to kind of prioritise that as well. But again, yeah. just to have the chance to be helpful um, is very nice to have that opportunity. Good stuff. And um, again, I came across some information that basically explained that you were a director of uh, an internet wine company. Is that still Functioning? Dead. Is it dead now? Uh, wine. Um, <laughs> I've never, to be fair, um, or to be, this is, this is where sometimes, of course, information that is supposedly available publicly is not always right. Um, I have, I mean, I, here we are. I mean, all right, there's a glass of wine right here. Very yeah. nice to do. <laughs> um, and I've done various things over the years with various people. Yeah. in the wine trade. Actually, there's a lovely synergy, I have to say, between cricket and wine. Mm. Uh, you can just tell that at Lord's, every morning in the Lord's Test match, there are champagne corks, you know, flying onto the ground at half past 10 in the morning. Um, <laughs> and there are a lot of very good friends I've made who happen to be involved in the wine trade mm. um, and who love their cricket. So, I mean, you know, again, going back to my great mate, Beefy, both of them, yeah. who's got both the wines out. And he seems to be doing very well with that, which is great. Um, I've done work with other people, made a little bit of money out of wine, um, as opposed to spending it. I think, on balance, I'm probably a long way negative on what mm. I've earned from wine <laughs> and what I've spent on wine. Um, but the last one, yeah, it's unfortunately the, the last little business that we tried to help along. Um, was a startup three or four years ago now. Really tough times. Um, long story, but uh, the sad end to that story is that it, it had to cease trading okay. a few months ago. Right. Um, so I'm afraid, you no, know, and I wasn't actually technically a director of that. Okay. 
Okay. And it hadn't got to that stage. Um, but right. I was helping out. I'd have to help me. I'd done my best to help raise money, raise funds to keep it going. Mm -hmm. um, but again, as, as a, it's, it's a good thing to be aware of, because again, in terms of this conversation, mm -hmm. You know, for instance, people have actually said to me, you know, well, you've got, you've, you've got a reputation for wine. Yeah, fine. Mm. Um, you know, why don't you start your own thing up? Mm. Um, and this was a very good lesson that it's all very well having a reputation, but every time you go into someone else's territory, yeah. and let's face it, there are a lot of people out there. I and mean, I work for, you know, Lathwaite. Tony Lathwaite has been doing this for 50 years. Right. And he is very good at it. Mm. And his organisation is very good at it. Mm -hmm. And if you see the Sunday Times Wine Club or the British Airways Wine Club, that's Lathwaite. You know, there are, they do lots, but they have nailed the business of sending wine to your home for the last 50 years. So if I came in saying, I'd like to do that, mm -hmm. I could even go to Tony and say, well, any advice? He'd say, yeah, leave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why do you want to do that? Um, yeah. So you've got to be very careful that you have the right, you know, you, there is the right sort of market there for you to mm. find a niche and make some money. And this, this thing that we had, um, the guy who was running it was very hard working. Um, I would say there were circumstances beyond our control that right. made it just too tough. Um, and in the current environment over the last few years, it wasn't enough to go from startup to getting a bit of traction. Mm. You know, the curve was slightly up, slightly up, down again, down again, slightly up again, down again, crunch. Mm. Um, so yes, you've got I mean, like, I mean, there are so many startups that do not succeed, let's face it. Yeah, of course. Um, mm. uh, so you've got to be very aware that, um, just cause you have a bit of a name mm. does not give you say the, you know, for instance, what was that Russell Crowe film? Um, there was one in a vineyard in France. I've forgotten, forgotten the title of the film now, but you know, that's a sort of dream mm. where in his, you know, you can imagine, of course, Russell Crowe, you know, it's probably, I'm sure he's probably got his own vineyard anyway by now, but mm -hmm. um, you know, for the film, purpose of the film, you come out of one environment, end up inheriting a property in France, say, or buying a property in France. Mm -hmm. And all that work, for instance, that goes into making wine, you know, yeah. you, you can show it in an hour and a half film, it looks glorious. And you've got the little cafe down the road, and the little bar, the little tabac, and you know, pretty French girl and the rest of it. And you think this is a lovely world. But actually, some poor bugger's got to tend those vines. Someone's got to prune those vines. Someone's got to yeah. make sure they don't get infected. Someone's got to make sure they get all the right treatment every day of the year. And if the frost is coming in May, you've got to cover it up or light candles or put paraffin lamps, whatever it might be, to make sure they don't get frostbitten. You know, mm -hmm. It is a very complicated business, which takes a lot of work. So, um, you know, again, all these dreams, yeah. you need to have substance be, you know, behind the dream if you're going to make, even have a tenth of a chance of making it work. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, obviously playing for England, you were captain for many, many years. Explain the feeling, obviously representing your country and uh, leaving the team out. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? The um, People describe it as a schoolboy dream. Uh, when I was playing cricket at school, I was just having a lot of fun playing cricket at school. Uh, I had no real concept at that stage that it would go much beyond that. When I was... 17 and playing for Leicester seconds for the first time in school holidays suddenly there was a oh hang on a second this you know, is not just fun now but this, this might actually work and you know, a year later I'm being paid huge money 25 pound a week to play for Leicestershire oh, wow. Um, <laughs> oh, wow eh it was, normally <laughs> gone by Friday. it was paid on a Thursday gone by Friday so that was that <laughs> luckily I was living at home yeah um, I could just about afford the petrol to get from home to the ground uh, and then three years after that, I'm playing for England. So there was, there was a, a fairly swift progression, which, mm. for whatever reason, you know, a bit of talent involved here and there, but you know, things fell into place very, very nicely. Yeah. And from that moment on, um, and especially another you know, couple of years on from that, uh, when I was first vice captain, mm. then you're aware that <clears throat> you know, the job is yours for the taking, as and when the slot is available. Then, of course, it gets tough because you either have had a very, very tough baptism, baptism mm. against the West Indies. Yeah. Um, let's say it didn't go well enough that, you know, well, you know, people understood. Mm. Um, and I will tell anyone very happily that if you looked at the West Indies side of the 80s, mm. that, to me, was the strongest ever side to play test cricket. Mm. You know, historians will argue about 
Bradman's side 48, the Invincibles of 48. Australians will argue about the decade, the 90s, that followed the West Indies in the 80s. Mm. So the Australians went largely unbeaten for a decade. And they did have some great players. You know, and they had Shane Warne and people like that. And, you know, yeah. Alan Borden, Mark Taylor and Steve Warren, loads besides. So um, you can have the argument as long, often as you like. You know, a glass of wine probably helps the argument go along nicely. But I <laughs> always say that West Indies were as strong as it gets, as good as it gets. Great bats and great bowlers and almost impossible to beat. So tough baptism then a success in India, then an Ashes win, then another West Indies tour and it all goes wrong again. So, um, but at the same time, you're always, uh, you're always proud to be England captain. And even when it's going wrong, mm. because you'll take the successes and you obviously want, you'd love the successes. And standing, for me, the pinnacle was standing on the balcony at the Oval in 1985 mm. with a little Ashes replica in my hand, holding it to the crowd below. Um, that was the proudest moment. Um, but four years later, I am at the Oval again, watching Alan Border receive all the accolades because he's come back and his team mm. has had a brilliant summer and we've had the most rubbish summer. And I'm a very chastened, unhappy, um, forlorn figure. Yeah. Uh, you know, so two, you know, two ends of a very long scale. Mm. Um, and so you have that thing. But even then, even that summer of 89, which is basically the summer where anything that could go wrong did go wrong for me and the team. That summer of 89, your England captain is going horribly wrong. You can either run away or somehow try and sort of hold the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you are actually, I mean, it, almost illogically, you're thinking, I don't want to give this up. I, mean, I like being England captain. Yeah. And at the same time, you're also where the whole nation is saying, get rid of him. You know, we've just lost the ashes. You know, we get, get someone else. You know, there is that sort of brutal side to it. Mm. But, um, you know, people crave success. And yeah, as much as the players do, uh, and you want to give success to the crowds and the public, whether they're there or not, you know, they're sort of the watching public, the supporting public. You want to give them that success. When you have a bad year like that, it's painful. Um, but you still want to be England captain. So anyway, I knew at the end of that summer that was not going to happen. Mm. Um, and all I had to do for the next three, four years was try and keep the, uh, you know, keep a career going somehow. And I was able to go from the huge disappointment of that summer. Um, mm. Didn't necessarily, I didn't go straight away. You, know, you, you don't pick it up straight away. But I had successes after that. Mm -hmm. um, had some good times after that. Uh, again, you know, they count as things to be proud of. And you, you just learn the lessons. You try and learn the lessons. Um, yeah. But we all, you know, as you know, as you well know, in sport, you have good days and bad days. And I remember when I first was making a sort of, you know, first making progress for Leicestershire. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my first seasons playing regularly in the first team at Leicestershire amongst a very strong team, a lot of senior, you know, senior well-honed professionals. And one of our um, immigrant Yorkshiremen, I mean, Ray Illingworth was captain. Mm. We had three or four others who'd come down from Yorkshire and were very good at Leicestershire. One of them, Jack Birkinshaw, off-spinning uh, off all-rounder, another left-hand batsman. Berkey said to me one day, so you'll have, he said, lad, you'll have good days and bad days in this game. There'll be more bad days than good, so make the best of the good ones. Mm. And it's quite a good advice to anyone in any sport and any business, actually. Mm. Yeah. That's amazing stuff. I mean, you touched on some some great uh, kind of insights. You gave us a great insight in terms of your career and obviously um, the highs and lows as well, which is basically what I'm trying to portray in, in the podcast mm -hmm. as well, because everyone's got a perception of athletes. And obviously, we've all seen you on TV before, and sometimes people have a certain kind of perception of yourself, me, uh, anyone else that they may see on TV or come across as an athlete. Um, so again, I'm really thankful for you coming on just because we get to see a different side to you. Um, one last thing, latterly, um, last but not least, would you say that more help's needed for athletes? So I'm talking about cricket, um, tennis, golf, football, rugby. Would you say there's more help needed when it comes to retirement for athletes? Um... I don't know the whole picture for the other sports. Um, I think it's 
I mean, we did touch upon you know, the things that, for instance, the PCA do to help retiring cricketers or cricketers who are yeah. coming towards the end of their days as a player. Mm. Um, and I think that is vital. Um, I think, and that has changed hugely over the last 50 years. Mm. Uh, it's probably changed, in fact, it's changed hugely over the last decade or just slightly longer. Um, so I think the awareness from the sort of administration side of, the, of all these games is there. And there are people, of course, who, as it were, bridge the gap. I mean, there are former players in all those sports who then become, as it were, consultants or you know, able to help other players find things to do, jobs to do, um, ways to follow up a successful sporting career. Um, so there are opportunities in, in all sorts of ways. But I think anything that the governing bodies can do or if you have something like the PCA or the, uh, the Football Association, the PFA, um, as much, whatever else they do, I think what they do in terms of giving lifelines and incentives and coaching and advice to their people when they leave the active playing side of the game, I think anything they can do is valuable. Um, and so I hope that that will continue to expand. I'm sure it will. Um, and it's interesting because you know the, the, the sort of the cruel thing about sport again, as you and I both know, is that you have a spotlight on you for so long. Yeah. Um, you have hopefully you know if you obviously if you're doing it for long enough, there's a certain element of success involved in that. Yeah. And there is that sort of uh, bubble you're in, where you're enjoying what you're doing because you know footballer loves kicking football. I love turning a cricket ball. You've got the competitive spirit. You've got so many things that are just good for you mm. and very healthy for you. And then the moment someone flicks the switch and that stops, it can be like that. You know, it's a pause. Mm. You know, it is a big pause. And if it's a short pause and you pick something up, fine. If it's a long, 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 long drawn out pause, then it's tough. Um, so yes, anything we can do, anything they can do, anything, anything anyone else can do to help people through that uh, is just, you know, it's very, very welcome. Brilliant. Um, if you want to just let everyone know where we can find you, where we can find your books, the name of your books, the name of any um, charities that you're running at the moment. Uh, yeah, most of the books, I'm, I'm actually in discussion to, uh, to write another book soon. Um, okay which uh, very early days in discussions, but uh, most of the other ones are probably out of print or in secondhand bookshops, uh, okay. which aren't open at the moment. But if you want to, you know, if you find one, whatever, great. Um, we do have a website, which is david-gower.com. Mm -hmm. If people need to get in touch, want to get in touch. Um, I dare say Sky would forward a, an email or two, um, <laughs> if need be. Yeah, um, I dare say the PCA would know where to find me. They would. They do know where to find me. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone's got any great ideas, um, I'm happy to listen. <laughs> They've got to be great ideas, all right? That's it. Yeah. Ones, great yeah. ideas. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I hope yeah, I hope that you know, whatever comes up over the next few years will be fun to do, interesting and productive. Brilliant. Looking forward to seeing you on my TV screen uh, going forward. Uh, once again, thanks for coming on, David. Really enjoyed the chat. I appreciate your time today. Danny, pleasure. Wish you well too. Um, and I think the word we're trying to spread here, the word you're trying to spread, is a very, very welcome one, a very, very important one. So good Brilliant. luck with that. Brilliant. Thank you. Hopefully speak soon. Right, Danny. Take care. Danny, well done, mate. Take care. Bye-bye.